Praise God. Before, hey, before we get started, man, I've been having this thought in my mind. It always comes back. I mean, I've preached on this multiple times. I've talked about it multiple times. Because God, I feel like God gave me a revelation about this. And the word is enculturation. I've been taught because, because it's the process by which someone's mindset and their understanding of life is influenced and changed. And, and you know, one of the things I was thinking is as we were singing some of these songs, I remember when I first got saved. I, I mean, I'm so different today than what I was when I first got saved. When I first gave my heart to Jesus. What, what do you mean got saved? I had heard the gospel that Jesus had died for my sin, but there came a place in my life when I was confronted with the decisions that I had made and the misery that I was in that I said, yes, Jesus. I need you. Amen. Amen. I, I need you to do something in me. I need you to change me. I want to give my life to you. You gave your life for me. I want to give my life to you. And that was just an introduction that threw me into a whole new realm. A world that I knew nothing about. You understand what I'm saying? Like, and Y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, some of you know were raised in the church. Sometimes when people are raised in the church, it's completely different. But what I'm trying to say is, is that God snatched me out of knee deep in the world. I've told y'all before, I had hair way down my back. I, you may not, I'm so old, you won't even know who this dude is. But his name was David Lee Roth. I thought I was like him. Like, that's what I wanted to be. He was like this lead singer for this band called Van Halen. All the girls thought he was so cool. I wanted to be like David Lee Roth. Point being is I wasn't nothing like him. I would have killed myself had I been. But, but you know what? Nevertheless, it was like foolishness. You understand what I'm saying? Every, I, I had a mindset. I had been enculturated by the world. And I think of music. And I can remember driving down the road. And I can remember that there was Christian music playing. Because that's what we were supposed to listen to. And I can remember thinking, man, I don't even understand what these people are talking about. <laughs> because it was a whole new world. A whole new realm that I had known nothing about. And there was a spirit that was dealing with me. That was kind of like irritated with what this new message was saying. Don't get me wrong. God had moved in. God had changed me. God had done a work in my life. I knew I didn't really want to go back to where I had been because the poison was killing me. But yet there was still this thing that was clinging to me. That was that was like saying, what is this? What are you even saying? What are you talking about the blood? What, what? Because I hadn't had a true revelation yet of what Jesus had really done. And I guess I'm just trying to say that sometimes whenever we're introduced into this whole new world, we didn't even know that these that these two kingdoms were existing at the yeah. same time. Do you realize that sometimes people don't have the first clue about church folk? They don't have the first clue about what the church believes. But that's why the music that we sing, that's why it sounds different because it's of a different spirit. Yeah. That's why it has different words because it has a different message. Yeah. The music of the world has a message and it helps to enculturate and and to instruct its people to go a certain way. Amen. I mean, you know, music has changed so much from whenever I was young. And I'm not going to sit here and try to quote lyrics from some stupid song that I used to listen to just to prove to you the worldliness of it. But, you know, like, like for instance, I mean, it's like I don't, I, I don't know everything and I don't really listen to this kind of music. But when I go to the gym, I don't wear earphones like I probably should. And I just I know that there's this one song and y'all probably going to laugh at me if y'all are young enough to know what I'm talking about. But they got some girl named Cardi B. That's her name. Right? Cardi B. I'm about to break down Cardi B for you right now. <laughs> She's like, talk, she's talking in the song. My name is Cardi B and I run this. And I'm not going to tell you what she said. I run this blank like cardio. <laughs> What's she trying to say? I got my business I'm taking care of. And I'm running it like a cardiovascular exercise. Because I got it going on. I'm making my business. I'm making my money, baby. I got my game. And, and basically, everybody's like, oh, yeah, Cardi B, you the bomb. You, you so hot, girl. You, you bringing all the money. We want to run, we want to run up in it like cardio. We want to do it like you do it, girl. You come hard, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Dude, she, Cardi B going to burn in the devil's hell if somebody don't tell her about Jesus. And she doesn't give her a heart. All the money, all the fame, all the stuff that she thought she got. What profit of man if he gained the whole world and he loses all soul? Cardi B ain't got nothing for me. I got something to tell Cardi B. If she listen, I can even make it rhyme for her. But we ain't gonna go there. Anyway, that's enculturation. 
That's the idea of what the world has a message for you and trying to convince you that it's got the right way. And I'm here to tell you, if you keep sipping on that poison, if you keep sipping on that poison, it's going to kill you. Right. It's going to kill you sooner or later. Lord, help us to come to the realization that we realize it's nothing but poison and it's killing us. Amen? Amen. Now, I did want to say this too. You, I like the fact, see, nowadays there's, the lines are being blurred. I got to be careful because I don't want to go too long this morning. The lines are being blurred because now the church is getting confused and bringing the world into the church. Oh, yeah. Changing the music, changing the message, yeah. changing the atmosphere. I'm telling you, you could go find another church in this town where they're going to have a whole lot more people in it. And the way that they set everything up, it's going to be real groovy. I know that word is outdated, but I feel like you still know what it means. It's going to be real groovy, and you're going to, be, you're going to feel more at home in that situation. You don't want to know why without really realizing it. And I don't even think the people behind it even know exactly why they're doing it. They're mic-mashing it. They're amalgamating it. What is an amalgamation? It's two different metals that come together and form one. They're taking the world culture, the church culture, they're bringing them together and they're making people feel, oh, this is a little bit more like home. I don't want that. I want there to be a clear line of demarcation. I'm not trying to say that Matt is always on the right side of the line because I'm still a human being and sometimes I still go in the wrong direction. But I want to know where that line is, folks. I want to know what is the plan of God, the church of God, the truth of God versus the lie of Satan. I don't want there to be a blurred line. I want to know the truth so that I can walk in truth, so that I can walk with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Don't blur the line for me. Philippians chapter 2. Verses 5 through 11. I do yell a lot. Somebody, I don't think my daughter was talking about me the other day, but she's like, I don't like no preacher yelling at me. <laughs> I don't think she was talking about me. I hope she still loves her dad. But I had one lady that said, I let, I'm leaving this church. I don't want no preacher. She blasted me on Facebook. I ain't going to that church. I want no preacher yelling at me. I'm not yelling at you, man. I'm yelling at the devil. And not only that, I'm passionate. I'm a passionate person. And I'm passionate about Jesus. But look, come on, somebody. Help me out here. I kind of get a little bit of that from my daddy. After this, I'm moving on with the message. I heard when I played in military school in football, I can remember, they put me in on defense. I shot the gap. I hit the quarterback, made him fumble the ball, recovered the ball. And all, my daddy was in the, in, the, uh, in the crowd, and he went to holler, and he had just got his false teeth. <laughs> he went to holler, that's right, boy, and them teeth flew out. He snatched them out the air, he stuck them back in his mouth, and he said, I'm about to get me a jerk chain on them things, a safety chain, so that we don't lose them. But the point was, later on, my sister told him, because she was, he, we were sitting at the table, and she was getting excited about Jesus. She's the, my, my older sister, Debbie. She's the one that got me saved. She started getting excited about Jesus. Well, come on, Daddy. You know, and talking to him about like preaching. She said, he said, well, I think you did a little bit too, uh, you know, too over the top with that religion stuff. She said, Dad, you sitting over there in the bleachers however many years ago hollering so much about a stupid football game that your false teeth come flying out your mouth and you had to snatch him out the air. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus died on the cross to set you free from your sin. I'm about to get excited up in here. Amen. Praise God. That makes sense right there. All right. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Here we go. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. If you read some of the other translations that are out there, the idea also is that even though he was in the form of God, he did not consider it something that to be grasped to or to be held on to, but instead he was willing to lower himself or humble himself. So he, he made himself of no reputation and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being, in fa being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of, of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name. Now I've got to tell you something. In the Greek language it's actually the name. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And what that means. It's not just a name. It's the name. Which is above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One of the first things that sticks out to me in this message is the concept of humility. The fact that Jesus renounced his rightful position as God and he lowered himself. He lowered himself in humility to become a man. Bible scholars call this the incarnation. What does that mean? Jesus before his incarnation, Jesus before he became flesh, the Bible teaches us this. When I talk to you about stuff, sometimes I don't explain it in detail, but basically almost everything that's coming out of my mouth is based upon the word of God. Whenever the, the, the way the Bible describes it is that in the beginning, Jesus was the word of God. He was the eternal son. He was the eternal word. And he spoke the world into existence through the word that Jesus spoke. God, the Holy Spirit began to move. Let there be light. The Holy Spirit made there to be light. The father had a plan. The word, the eternal son spoke the plan and the Holy Spirit enacted the plan. But then the word became flesh. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. The word became flesh. It means the incarnation. Jesus, God, hallelujah, in form he was God. He lowered himself in humility and he became a man. <coughs> the Lord it required that he take off his deity. What does the word deity mean? It means God, Godness, if I could say it that way. He took off as though it were a garment. He took off his deity. He took off his Godness and he clothed himself with the frailty or the weakness of humanity. The entire purpose was so that he could serve others. He served the Father and mankind by fulfilling the plan of God, a plan that required death to pay the penalty for sinful man. He was God who became man and was raised equal with deity as a man. I just want you to think about this. I know that I just said a whole lot right there, but just, I just want you to imagine this. Jesus in the beginning was God in form. We don't know what it looked like. We weren't ever there. The angels in heaven saw it. He was in form as God, but yet he condescended or he lowered himself. He clothed himself in humanity. Then he died on the cross. With a, a man without sin died on the cross. A perfect man that was without sin. Why did it require that? Because you couldn't die for your own sin. That's why Islam don't work. Because the martyr's already full of sin himself. He can't die for his own sin. No. God created Adam and Eve. They had no sin. Then they went towards sin in their own free will. And they made that choice. And they brought sin into the human race. Therefore, it required a, the God man who had no sin, the righteous one, to die for the sins of mankind to make sinful man right with God. That's But what I want you to understand is this, is that Jesus condescended, lowered himself, became a man, died on a cross to save humanity, then was resurrected as the first glorified one. The Bible says in the book of Colossians that he was the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. He's the first of the glorified ones. There's, I, don't, I think I can say it like this. One day there's going to be a completely new race. A race of human beings that you've never seen before. I'm telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says we're going to have glorified bodies. Just as Jesus resurrected, we also will resurrect. And we are going to be clothed with a new kind of body that we don't know exactly what it looks like. But, I do, but, but nevertheless, it's going to be different than anything that we ever understood. We're going to be, have a glorified body. We're going to live for an eternity. We're no longer going to have sin on the inside of us. Even, even when we were here and we were desiring to worship with the Lord, the, the worship the Lord, there's the possibility some of you in here thought bad thoughts. Yeah. I mean, it happens. Sure. Yeah. But, and, but isn't it frustrating? Yeah. yeah, it is. Especially sometimes whenever you're really trying to worship the Lord and all of a sudden this stupid thought enters your mind. It's like, what in the yeah. world is that? And the enemy's like, look at you. You ain't no good. You're full of sin. No, the devil, you're a liar. You're a liar in the Father. Yeah, I might be full of sin, but hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He died to set me free and to make me something that I'm not supposed to be. Amen. Amen. And one day, hallelujah, that stuff's going to be gone. Amen. Amen. But he's the first of the glorified ones. He's, he's the, the God man 
who became man, who became the man God, who's been exalted and glorified. And now as the glorified first human being, he is deity, he's God. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. It's just an amazing concept yeah, for me yeah. to think about. Amen. Maybe I think too much, I don't know. But it's just amazing to me because one day, hallelujah, you and I are going to also be exalted. We're going to be resurrected. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord Jesus. I mean, you're never going to be the king of kings because there's only room for one of those. But it's going to be so different. You know, this is the answer. I'm talking about humility right now. Jesus lowered himself and got exalted. Amen. Amen. This is actually an answer to prayer, and, and you don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying before he goes to the cross. And he's saying, now, he said, I accomplished your work on earth. Amen. Now glorify me with the glory I had with you in the beginning of the world. In the glory that we shared with one another, give it back unto me. Hallelujah. He had it in the beginning. Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. Jesus is God. He always was God. He was the God that spoke the world into existence. Hallelujah, man. And now, he, and now he's the, the God man, hallelujah, that's been glorified and he ever lives to make intercession for us. There's a hope. Let me tell you something. I don't know what you're going through this morning. This ain't in my notes. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know how bad it is, how desperate you feel. But I'm here to tell you, you got to hold on to this. This is not the last say so. There are seasons in the life of the Christian and there are times where there are mountain peaks and there are valleys. But God knows how to get people out of valleys and he knows how to bring people back up on mountaintops. But when it's all said and done, the enemy doesn't have the last say so. I'm here to tell you this morning that in the end, there's a city whose builder and maker is God. And the people of God are pilgrims on this land. If you refuse to look to the future of what God has planned for his children and be satisfied with the promises of eternity and instead you continue to say no I want what I want today right here on this earth you are going to be one sad person you are going to be one miserable person why do you want to say that preacher because it's true because if you keep looking for and searching for what this world has to offer to bring fulfillment, I don't care if it's a new set of clothes, a new cool pair of boots, some new car that smells like fresh leather, a nice house with crown molding, a, a better looking version of whatever you thought you wanted, whatever it is, it's going to leave you empty. Amen. That's it. The preacher said one time, he made it real simple. There's a God-sized hole in your heart. There's only one piece of the puzzle that's going to fit it and make it feel right. And it just fits just perfect when it's Jesus and you put it in there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus said, give me that glory that I had with you whenever I was in the beginning. Jesus was humble. He humbled himself. That was the result of his humility. He humbled himself. God exalted him. The next thing I noticed in that passage of scripture, it talked about the name. He was exalted by God to the highest rank of power and he was given the name. In the Greek, it's the, the definite article is there. What does that mean? Just to get you fancy, we're not just talking about his name, Jesus the Christ. You know that Christ wasn't his last name, right? That's his title. He, he, he did have a name, Jesus. It's the Greek version of the Hebrew Yeshua, which is Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. His name bared what he did. He, he truly was the author of salvation. But it's bigger than that. It's a concept that's really hard for you and I to understand. It's a Hebrew concept, the name. The name was how the Hebrew person would address God. It described his dignity, his royalty. It described that he was above all else. They wouldn't even say his name. They called him the name. He deserved all adoration, all glory to be bowed before, to be worshipped. He, he was the name. And God the Father, because of Jesus' humility, bestowed upon him the name. He's worthy of all worship. He's worthy of all praise. He is the name. And it's within that thought that God the Father says, oh no. There's going to be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the name because that is the way that I wrote it and that is the way that it will be. And one day, every human being, everything on the earth, everything under the earth is going to recognize that God was right and they will bow and they will confess. It denotes, it describes the name, describes his divine presence. 
the very fact that the God of glory exists and he is present with us. And one of the last things I wanted to mention in my introduction has to do with confession. They will bow and they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the name. And it's going to bring glory and honor to the Father yes. because it's going to prove to every liar, to every doubter, to every naysayer that everything that God said was true. And woe unto those people on that day that flippantly thought just because they couldn't see him that they didn't have to listen to what it was that he had given them about his word. You know, the word confess comes from a Greek word, which means to openly confess. But not only that, it also means to agree with someone. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I'm going to explain it a little bit here more in one of my points. But it means to agree. It means to come in agreement. When you're confessing about the name Jesus Christ, you're coming into agreement with the Father. Yes, Father, I see now what you've been trying to tell me. I see now what you've been saying. Yes, I agree with you. You know, there's going to be a day when revelation is going to be given. And we're going to realize, I've already said it, but God was right after all. His word was indeed his and it told us the truth. God's word was the truth. Not Cardi B's song. No, that was a lie. Not, not the whole music genre that tried to move us in a certain direction or what Hollywood said that said same-sex marriage was okay and illicit just casual sex was okay and doing whatever you wanted to do was okay. No, that's a lie from the enemy. God's word is true. God's word is the final authority. Mankind will be judged based upon his word and the fact that he gave us Jesus. So what are you saying, preacher? you saying that you never did any of those things? Of course not. I was the worst. Like the Apostle Paul said, I was the chiefest of sinners. You don't think I'm getting in on my own merit, do you? You don't, you don't think that I'm going to make it in just because I'm a preacher, do you? No. I'm going to make it in because of the righteousness of Jesus and that he paid the penalty for my sin. He will set us free. He will begin to teach us and instruct us and enculturate us according to his word. And if we don't stiffen our neck and harden our heart and we're willing to submit and surrender to his will, he will begin to change us. Amen. But at the same time, we would say, oh, I don't want to bow now. I don't want to bow now. That's the word of the world. <clears throat> That's a message for the world. You know, we used to talk about it. I was kind of joking around yesterday with one of my kids. And I remember that quote from Aleister Crowley. Oh, Lord, why are you even going to bring him up? That crazy guy that black magic can influence the world through music. Remember what his saying was? Do what thy wilt and let that be the whole of the law. Not what God says. See, God says, submit thyself. God says, humble thyself, and I will exalt you. But what the world says is, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. And, and, and they breed that concept in us of self-exaltation, refusal of self-denial. And the problem is, is that when it's all said and done and every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess, the revelation is going to be given that God was right after all. God was right after all, that his truth was right after all. The problem with man was that, that, it was, that the problem with man was that it was sin after all. Oh my gosh, lo and behold, it really was sin. When that preacher was over there in the gym and he was talking about the problem right here is sin. And I sat over there on my little box and I said, well, I don't think the problem is sin. It doesn't really matter what you think, sir. I know I can't necessarily talk to him that way because then I'm going to shut him down. But I'm thinking it doesn't really matter what you say, sir. The word of God's truth. Did you even bother to open it up and read it? It said the problem with man was sin. Sin came into Adam's fallen race. Sin separated man from God's holiness. And in the midst of the world of sin, sin enculturated mankind and moved him away from God, clouded his mind, clouded his judgment, made him think that he was right. In the higher institutions of academia, the, the, the instructors, the professors, they're so smart. They're so intelligent. Oh, they, they have so... No, it's human wisdom and it's built on lies and it's contrary to the word of God. And they sit here and they tell people, Oh no, it's not sin. It's not that's not the problem. It's just it's a mental illness. Yeah, your mentality's ill. <laughs> of course it is. It's part of the fall. Amen. It's part of the sin from the fall. Right. Yes. And the enemy's wanting to destroy you. 
And one day the revelation is going to be given that, you know what, it wasn't what psychology said. It wasn't what man made it out to be. But that in reality it was the problem of sin and that God had written a prescription, but mankind refused to just go fill it at the pharmacy. Because it wasn't the way that they wanted to do it. How many times do things come across your path in the day when you're just like, you know what, I don't want to do it that way. And sometimes it's right. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I ain't doing that. I ain't going your way on that instruction there. That's not right. But how many times is God's word trying to say something and mankind's got an answer for something else? Mankind, true, it's going to be true after all that empty and hurting heart that had searched and yearned for that one thing that was going to fill them up Always searching, never finding. It was only, they're going to find out it was only one call away. The revelation is going to be given that I searched lying, high and low. I looked, oh, I went over mountains. Who was that that, that wrote that song? I was probably you two or something. I swim the deepest ocean, climb the highest mountain, and I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You ain't going to find it like that, Bono. You're looking at all the wrong places, dude. You even tried to say you believed in Jesus. No, you never surrendered your heart to him. Amen. You can climb the highest mountain. You can swim the deepest oceans. You, you're looking in the wrong spot, dude. He's just one call away. He's just right there. He's right there. Yeah. One humble call away is all it takes. Amen. Had they just called on the name, but they wouldn't call on the name. They wouldn't call on the name because they were hardened of heart. They had been enculturated and they just didn't believe. And you know what? The good news is this, is that there's people in this room today, that's not you. You wouldn't be in this place if you wasn't willing to call on the name of the Lord. Amen? I mean, that's not you. But all of us in this place sometimes still do some of what they do. Amen. In other words, we don't, we're not hard in that way because we love God, but we harden in other ways. We resist against it. Listen to me. Don't think that I'm preaching to you because I, I mean, some of you, I know what you're going through. I'm talking to myself as a human being with a free will and still with a sinful nature because that sinful nature isn't leaving until we see Jesus. There's a struggle that takes place in each and every human heart that we still harden ourselves and resist against humbling ourselves in certain areas. God wants us to humble ourselves. Amen. Amen. That's my first point I want to talk to you about. Are you hot? Can you crank that one down right there? You don't have to worry about the other one. Just crank that one down a little bit. That's the first thing I want to talk to you all about this morning. Humility. The text that we had looked at in 2 Philippians 5 and verse 7, two different things were said. It said he was of no reputation. It said he took upon himself the form of a servant. And in verse 8 it said he humbled himself. And again in verse 8 it says he became obedient. All these words describe humility. Jesus lowered and humbled himself to fulfill the Father's will, which was to save Adam's fallen race from their sin. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is the, is the, is the visi visible representation of the invisible God. He's the, he's the, the image of the invisible God. To me, that's so great revelation. Like it's a blueprint. Yes. God said, I know you can't see what I look like. So I'm going to send my word and I'm going to tell you that I'm going to send you the blueprint. I'm going to, thousands of years before Jesus was ever born, God began to, I wish I had time to go through the whole Old Testament. It'd take me about 15 minutes to do it. And, but, but real quickly, to be able to remind you that God for thousands of years, through the prophets, through the mouths of his prophets, prepared humanity, prepared his people Israel, that Jesus was coming. He didn't say his name was Jesus. He said Messiah was coming. And his people were waiting for Jesus to come. And Jesus, sure enough, came. And when he came, he was the visible representation of the invisible God. He was a blueprint. His actions showed us the Father. Look what it says in John chapter 5, verse 19. His actions showed us the Father. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For what things soever he does, the Father, these also does the Son likewise. What I wanted you to see was the humility of heart. Jesus isn't down here doing his own thing. Jesus isn't down here doing his own thing. He's come to do the Father's will. 
He says, I do what I see my father do. And in the, and in the course of him doing what he sees the father do, he's provided for us a blueprint. Not only can you read his word, but you can watch his actions as you read his word. And you can see how he responded in situations and circumstances. How he responded whenever people treated him improperly. Humility. How he lowered himself and willingly went to the cross to die. But not only that, just in everyday life, how he handled his, how he handled things. How he was with sinners. <laughs> Come on, somebody, help me out here. <laughs> how Jesus was with sinners. How Jesus was with people like you and me. The Apostle Paul says some of you were homosexuals, some of you were fornicators, some of you were uh, drinking till you had no sense left in your head. Such as this were some of you. <clears throat> How quickly we forget where we were. How quickly we forget where God brought us from. And we peer down our religious little nose on people. Come on, somebody, help me out here. Amen. Jesus, the Bible says Jesus ate at meat with sinners. What does that mean? He went to them. Listen, I don't recommend you go hang out at the Rat Skull or whatever they hang out nowadays, and you're going to go hang out and have fellowship. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't go do what they did. Jesus brought light into the midst of darkness. You ain't strong enough to try to walk knee deep up in the midst of darkness and the fellowship with darkness and think you're going to bring that same. No, that ain't how it works. <laughs> But anyway, what I'm trying to say is this, is that Jesus' actions, he came to do what he saw the Father do. Amen. He came to bring light in the midst of darkness. He humbled himself. How did he treat them sinners? This is where I was going with that. Remember that woman that was caught in adultery? They were ready to stone her. I mean, it, it, listen, we could get into this deep. I didn't even have this in my notes, so I didn't plan to say it. But, you know, the Bible says he was down there writing something in the dirt. Nobody really knows what he was writing in the dirt. One person brought up a good point. He's probably writing the dude's name. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wasn't it amazing how all the religious leaders brought the girl to him? We caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Lord, what you going to do her? The name of this. Yeah. Well, where's the old boy? I mean, I'm just trying to say, I'm just trying to be real here. I mean, if you caught her in the very act, where's the dude? Yeah. He's probably one of y'all. Yeah. He's probably one of y'all. He's probably one of your religious leaders. And y'all like trying to band together and y'all just trying to throw her to the wolves. Jesus, Jesus got him good though. He said, you that is without sin, you go ahead and you throw the first stone. You trying to talk about the law, how the law said in the Old Testament that the man and the woman both that are caught. That's what the law said. The man and the woman both that were caught in adultery were not to be forgiven. Take them outside and stone them to death. That's it. But Jesus is looking at this. He's got a heart of compassion. He says, if one of y'all is without sin, why don't you go ahead and cast the first stone? But then he told her that she could be forgiven. Amen. And he told her that to, to go forward and to and when he says sin no more, he's talking about the fact that you start living your life for the Lord. Amen. That's his actions. He said, I see I do what I see my father do. But he also spoke the words of the father. Look at John chapter 12, verse 49 through 50. We're talking about humility. We're talking about the fact that he lowered himself. We're talking about the fact that he wasn't down here run, running this thing like cardio, doing it his own way, in his own actions, in his own strength. But instead, he had a plan to submit to the father to fulfill the father's plan. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? It's the opposite of what the world is looking to do. Jesus said, for I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting whatsoever I speak. Therefore, even as the father said unto me, so I speak. In other words, I do what I see my father do. I say what I hear my father say. I'm here to do the will of my father. I'm submitting myself. I lowered myself from deity. I clothed myself with human frailty. Now I do what the father tells me to do. And I say what the father tells me to say. He also said to his disciples, after you don't have to turn there, but it's in John 4, whenever he, whenever he was speaking to the Samaritan woman. You remember he had that long conversation with her? Then his disciples show up and said, have you had something to eat? The way they said that in the King James language is, 
do you have some meat? They weren't necessarily talking about carne asada. They were just talking about food in general. Do you have some meat to eat? Because they had gone to town to get food while he was talking to that woman. He said, my meat is to do my father's will and to accomplish it. He was humble is what I'm trying to say. Jesus lowered himself. Does that make sense? He, was, he, he had authority as to position. Well, how can God have a... Have, that's the Godhead. The Father is supreme authority. The Son willingly humbles himself under the Father's authority. And the Holy Spirit does all the work for the Godhead. Hallelujah. Amen. Through what Jesus has already done. The Holy Spirit is the continued hands upon the earth. Amen. That works in your life and in my life. We're going to understand it a whole lot better when we get there. But right now, I'm just going to believe it. Amen? Amen. It makes sense to me. But why does it make sense to me? Because God wants to teach us humility. So therefore, he humbled him over his own self to show us. Amen? Amen. <laughs> his actions and his words serve as a blueprint for our lives. Jesus humbled himself and was exalted by the Father. And this serves as a truth for us. We must humble ourselves in him. But there is a battle that rages in the heart of man. Can you put up there Galatians 5.17? There's a battle that rages in the heart of man. Sometimes you get frustrated with yourself. You desire to do right. You desire to do good. You fail God. You don't understand what's going on. I don't have time to break it all down completely, but you know what this passage is saying? The flesh. You know what it's talking about right there? It's talking about that fallen part of man that he received from Adam. The flesh, you could say it like this. The flesh is at war against the Holy Spirit that lives in you. That's yeah, You could say it like that. That's no meaning. The sinful nature, fallen part of you that you receive from your, from your father Adam is at war against the Holy Spirit that now lives in you because he's talking to Christians. If, you got, if you've been saved, that means the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. If you haven't been saved, if you haven't been born again, then the Holy Spirit doesn't live in your heart yet. All right? But you can, you can make it today. Amen? Amen? But there's a war going on. The Spirit is against the flesh, and these two are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. The Holy Spirit moved into your heart, and He began to speak to you and tell you what was right from wrong. Oh, your heart can become hard. Your conscience can become seared. You can start to believe what the teachers say. You can start to believe what the world says. You can start to believe what Cardi B says. And your heart can become hardened. And your conscience can become seared. And you can get to the point where you don't really hardly believe it anymore. But the Spirit of God on the inside of you is still con continuing with you. And saying, no, don't go this way. But the flesh in you that has not wanted to surrender yet is still. And so there's a fight that's ensuing. A struggle that's taking place until the heart of man is willing to surrender to the will of God. The battle that results from the remnant. You know, Brother Swagger says it like this, the clinging vines of the fall. But isn't that good? You ever tried, you ever ran up in the woods in, in Louisiana before? <laughs> I ran and tried to run in the woods in Louisiana before. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, you, ever, you, ever, you know what I'm talking about? If you run into some of them thin vines, you get all tangled up in it. The clinging vines of the fall, holding you back, trapping you, holding on to you, not wanting to let you go. The, the things that you find yourself doing that you normally would not want to do because now the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. At least you need to understand what's going on. There's a spiritual battle that's taking place. Amen. And just as Jesus humbled himself. Hallelujah. And was exalted by the Father. You and I, as we begin to humble ourselves to the will of God, the Holy Spirit begins to move into place. It's a real strategic thing. God's not fooled. He's sitting back and he's waiting. He's waiting for the call. He's waiting for the surrender to move in and to do the work that we need yes. him to do. Amen. You don't have to turn there for sake of time, but you know, Jesus did the opposite of Satan. Book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verses 12 through 13 says this. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Jesus said, I saw him, Satan, like lightning fall to the earth. 
he wasn't talking about while he was on earth. He was talking about when he was the pre-incarnate word that spoke the worlds into existence. Deity before mankind was ever formed, before mankind was ever, was ever formed of the dust of the earth. Jesus was in heaven in the form of God and saw Satan fall like lightning to the ground. Satan did the opposite of what Jesus did. Satan tried to exalt himself and was cast down. Jesus lowered himself and was exalted by God. Amen. Amen. That was point number two. That was humility. Point number two is this. <coughs> I said, I, I mean, that was point number one. Humility. Point number two is this. It's a question. What is your mindset? It's not just a question for you. It's a question for me. What is our mindset? Because the Apostle Paul said in verse five of Philippians chapter two, verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. The mind that was in Jesus needs to be in you. A mindset of humility. A mindset of willingness to surrender. A mindset that is not like Satan was, full of pride to exalt himself, but instead a mindset that's willing to lower himself. Do we have the same mindset as Jesus where we want to do what, what we would see the Father do, where we would want to say, what the Father would say, do we have the mindset of being willing to lower self and humble self for the right purpose, which is to bring glory to God? Look at 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 7. Just bear with me. I'm going to, I'm trying to move forward. We're talking about submission. We're talking about mindset. We're talking about humility. Look what he says right here. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yeah, all of you subject one to another. That means humble yourself to each other. You know, in the body of Christ, that there's supposed to be a level of humility where we approach each other with a level of humility. Where even though you may come at me a certain way, I'm supposed to try, by the grace of God, to humble myself. Amen. It's not always easy. Right. Amen? And be clothed with humility. Why? Because God resists the proud. <laughs> But he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Jesus humbled himself. God exalted him and gave him the name. When you and I humble ourselves, God promises to exalt us. You know, the word of God talks about people willingly submitting to others in positions of authority. I've been talking about this a lot lately. I was actually in a conversation with some people in the gym yesterday. And it was kind of funny. I was talking to a police officer. And I was admitting to him how when I came out of the drug cultured world, dude, I was like, I know that this is so spiritual because I, I hated police because that's what I was taught to do to hate police. I'm not saying they ain't got no bad police. That's not what I'm saying. I know that they got some bad ones. But let me tell you something, whenever they caught me in that field when I was about 17 and I was jacked up on, on pills and alcohol and they beat me with them sticks, I can have a bad attitude the next morning when I wake up and I got black eyes and, and marks all over my body. But the reality was, if it was, I didn't submit myself to them. They told me to stand down and instead I talked trash to them and I made the wrong move and guess what? They put a whooping on me. <laughs> and you can say whatever you want, police brutality, but had I done the right, had I not been on the pills and the alcohol to begin with, I would have been lucid enough to realize, uh-oh, danger, the police are here, there's like five or six of them, one of me, and they got sticks and guns. <laughs> it's not really that take a lot of brains <laughs> but boy let me tell you yeah, yeah. Bah, 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 bah. that was just one instant but I realized that even after I got saved I was sharing this at the, at the gym yesterday with a guy I can still remember I was sharing this with somebody else the other day too but it's, it's still so vivid in my mind even after I got saved and was going to church at least twice a week if not three times a week I can remember being in Kanata's parking lot and still got my long hair still thinking like I'm you know I'm like you know learning from Cardi B and hey, I'm part of that system dude I'm running my business like this man and, and, and still had so much of that world in me and whenever the policeman walked up I don't know what he was coming for. Maybe my inspection sticker was bad. I don't know what it was. I rolled down my window about that much. I'm like, what you got, bro? What you need? You coming to arrest me? Because I know I didn't do nothing wrong. You think I'm scared of you? Okay, if you're not arresting me, goodbye. And rolled the window down. Because that's how cocky I was. That's how arrogant I was. That's how much I hated authority. The Lord is saying right here, submit yourself to your elder. 
Because if you can't submit yourself to a man on earth, how in the world are you ever going to submit yourself to a God in heaven that you cannot see? Amen. I'm just saying. Are you trying to say that all policemen are right? No, I'm not. But you're going to do a whole lot better. Listen, the proverb says, a soft answer turns away wrath. Right. All, it, all it's going to take is just a little bit of humility. And next thing you know, you're probably going to get out of the mess that you was about to get yourself in. And even if he is a jerk. That's right. I don't know why I'm going off on this. Right. It happened to me not that long ago. About a year ago. Listen, man, you ain't going to... You ain't going to state your case in court when you got a speeding record like I do. I'm just being honest with you, dude. I got way too many speeding tickets. But here's this one time where I had my cruise control set, but I was I was in the left lane. And that state trooper stopped me. And I'm telling you, he, he I've seen this guy before. And immediately, he he I felt like, I, well, I asked him, what you stop me for? You were speeding. I said, can I look at the radar? I don't have to show you the radar. <laughs> And dude, I knew I wasn't speeding because I almost, I knew I, I, I mean, I'm just being real with you. I ain't got nothing to lie about, dude. I got so many speeding tickets, not even funny. Dude, you know, I went to court. I took my day off at work, I, I, afternoon off at work, not to try to get out of the ticket. Because I, I told the judge, I said, sir, you ain't about to let me off no ticket. I got my checkbook in my pocket. I'm ready to go pay my fine. I'm just trying to tell you that this state trooper right here, he was wrong. And I wanted to make you aware of his name because the way he treated me was wrong. And guess what? If he's treating me that way, he'll treat other people that way also. I mean, I'm not trying to say that it was all, all the right thing to do. Why did I even get into that? I don't know, but I could have. I just feel like the thing could have even escalated even worse. But at some point in time, I realized that when he escalated and I escalated a little bit, it wasn't going to be too much further that I realized something told me you need to shut up right now. You need to shut up right now and just take your lick on the chin, dude, because it's about to get... What? Maybe it's because now I have something to lose. I mean, you think about that. I, I, I don't want to get too philosophical on you, but, that, but whenever I was in that car and I rolled the window down to that policeman, I had nothing. Nothing. Barely had the clothes on my back that I brought from my mama's house when I went to my sister's. I was a high school dropout, a life that had been destroyed by drugs and alcohol. I don't even want to get into all the other stuff that was wrong with me at that point in time. But what I'm trying to tell you about is I had nothing in my cocky, arrogant attitude towards that policeman. But now, by the grace of God, the way that he's helped me out and he's, 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 given, he's allowed me to accomplish some things, I got some stuff to lose, dude. That's, that's part of the... There, there's a lot of times I'd like to take matters in my own hands. Because I don't like the way things have gone. And I want to try to protect and I want to help and I want to do that. But guess what? I, you, God has done some things in my life and I can't just like allow it to all be thrown away. And if we want God to do things in our life, we better start realizing... Amen. That that if he's over here helping to build it up and helping to get us to the place that we want to be, but yet we're over here going right behind him and destroying it. Yeah. He resists the proud. God resists the mindset that says, I want to do what I want to do. I want to do it the way I want to do it. He's against it because it's not like Jesus. That's why. <laughs> it's not like Jesus. I mean, what's the big deal? Take the humble road, lower self, Jesus lowered self, because it's the pride in us that doesn't want to do that. Right? right? right. He resists that mindset. He doesn't give grace to that. You and I could be in the worst time of our life. Desperate need. We need grace in this situation, in this circumstance. But the way we respond is with pride instead of humility, and God will not bless that. If you will do what Jesus did and humble self, he will do for you what he did for Jesus. He will exalt you. He's not going to make you. I said it already. The king of kings. There's only room for one of those. But he will exalt you. The words, you know what the word exalt means? To lift up on high. To raise to a place of dignity, honor, and happiness. Isn't that good? God wants to give you some dignity. He wants to give you some honor. You think you're going to get it from the world? No, really. Let me tell you something. The world will remember every bad thing you ever did. And they will try to throw it in your face every chance they get. And you trust them. And you lock hands with them. You lock arms with the world. Go ahead and do it. 
Keep on giving them a chance to speak into your life. Keep on giving. The world is of another spirit and they will hurt you every time that they get a chance because they are hurting themselves and they're looking for somebody to drop down lower. They may not know that they're doing it on, they may not be doing it on purpose. Some of them are. Some of them are so wicked that, and they're so hurt that all they want to do is hurt other people. Amen. But I'm telling you right now, you keep on. But if you humble yourself in the eyes of God, the Lord will lift you up. He will give you dignity. He will give you honor. He will give you a level of happiness. Point number three has to do with the name. And I'm going to actually move through this relatively quickly. But the first scripture, you can turn there if you want, but I don't even know that I'm going to read it, is Ezekiel 48, 35. The word is Shama. It's in the Hebrew. I'm talking about the name. I'm talking about names of the Lord. Jehovah Shama. And this particular scripture is talking about the new city. It's an Old Testament scripture, but it's talking about the new city that Jesus is now building for us. Hallelujah. And it will come back again. That may sound like science fiction to you, but it's going to happen. Jesus told Philip it's going to happen. The word of God says it's going to happen. It's going to happen. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And in that city, the Lord is there. The Lord is Shama. His presence is there. Listen to me. God's plan has been all about getting the presence of the Lord to us. The word of God says in Matthew chapter 1 verses 22 through 23 that, that, that it was done this way to fulfill the words of God through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us because that's what Emmanuel means. God with us with us. Why did they name him Jesus? Because he was Yeshua. He was Jehovah his salvation. But he was Emmanuel because Yeshua was God present with us. Hallelujah. Word of God says in John 1 14 that the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. The word that spoke the world into existence clothed himself with humanity and lived amongst us. God was present. He was, he is Jehovah Shammah. I need you to know today that he's there. I need you to know today that he's there because you might find yourself in a situation where you feel all alone. Yeah. Amen. Let me tell you something. You don't have to be all alone. I don't know how much, how I can explain this in detail enough to, I wish my words would just really work like they're supposed to work, but until the Holy Spirit gives you revelation, they're just the words of a man. Holy Spirit, give people revelation. You never have to be alone because He was alone. He's the only one that ever had to be really alone. You might not feel Him, but I'm telling you, He's one humble call away. It, why did He, what do you mean He had to be alone? When He hung on that cross, and he cried out, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment in time, the father had to turn his head from Jesus. And, and, and Jesus did not feel the presence of his father in that moment of time. And it wasn't because of Jesus' sin, because he had no sin. It was because of Matt's sin that God the father had to turn away from him and remove his presence in that moment of time. Jesus was alone. He had to face the forces of darkness alone. You don't have to face the forces of darkness. You can call on the name. Jehovah Shammah is there. He's Jehovah Sid Canoe in Jer Jeremiah 23 verse 6. He talks about the fact that there's going to be a day when Judah will be shaved, saved. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord of Righteousness. That's what his name means. Jehovah Sidkenu, he's the Lord, our righteousness. That's what Sidkenu means. He's the Lord, our righteousness. Listen to me. In John chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God the Father gave a gift. He gave his son Jesus. And Romans chapter 5, 17 explains that not only did the father give a gift, but the son gave a gift. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Romans 5, 17, that by one man's offense, death reigned by one. You know what that means? Adam's sin caused sin to come to each and every one of us. 
but, but much more will they receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, which is given by the one, Jesus Christ. See, God the Father gave a gift. He gave His Son to you and I. Jesus turned around and gave us the, a gift to us because He is the righteousness of God. And when He hung on the cross, He took your guilt on Him and He gave you the gift of His righteousness. Yeah. He is Jehovah Sidkenu. He is your God of righteousness. I don't care what you've done. Listen to me. Oh, the world might care. If everybody knew, even your own mama and your daddy, as much as they love you, if they knew everything you had done and every thought you thought and everything that you done, they might, they might be like, oh my God. I don't care what you've done. Ain't nothing so bad that the blood of Jesus can't come. Amen. Ain't nothing to this. Yeah. Jesus was determined, man. Jesus was determined to come down here and to fulfill the will of the Father. The enemy and the world and the people of the world will try to constantly make you feel guilty and unworthy. But I'm here to tell you, I got a word for you. He is Jehovah Sidkenu. And when you feel as though you have no hope because you've just gone too far, I'm telling you, those are the words of the liar. They are not the words of Jehovah Sidkenu. Because he would say, no, no, I gave you a gift. I was bestowed with righteousness. I was the deity that clothed myself in the frailty of human flesh and I willingly went to that cross and I hung there and I took your guilt. The worst, even while you were yet a sinner, I died for the ungodly. Hallelujah. You don't have to lie anymore. I'm not saying you got to come clean with the person next to you because you might not be able to trust them. I'm trying to say you don't have to lie to the Lord anymore. You can pour your heart out to Jehovah Sid Canoe and you can say, but what about this, God? There are things that took place in my life before I was converted that I don't even want to talk about because not only is it horrendous the things that I engaged in and the things that I caused and the trauma I caused, but it would hurt other people. And I don't doubt that I doubt that they'd be watching it on video. But if by some chance somebody that knew what happened to come across the video, they would know who I was talking about and the pain that I've caused. But God forgives. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He forgives the worst of sin. The self-righteous doesn't like to hear it. Oh, yeah, but, you know, look at what they did. They can't be forgiven and go to heaven. And don't, now, you don't tell God what he can do. <laughs> the clay doesn't talk back to the potter. <laughs> He's Jehovah Sidkenu. He gave you a gift. He's Jehovah Jireh. Genesis chapter 22. Abraham. <laughs> Abraham brought his son Isaac up that hill and went to offer him as a sacrifice. And God provided a lamb that day, a ram in the thicket. God provided a sacrifice. I wrote this different than I'd ever written it before, so I'm going to read it. In Abraham's most desperate time, God provided. That's what Jehovah Jireh means, God the provider. God provided, and you and I need to understand that in our most desperate time that we will ever face, God has already provided. Just as God provided a lamb on that day as a sacrifice to spare Isaac's life, God provided a lamb on that day, Jesus, to spare our lives. A lamb that allowed a gift of righteousness to be given, <coughs> that allowed access to grace to be granted, that will allow the presence of God to enter the darkest of circumstances and bring hope where there is no hope and resurrection life where there seems to only be death. Let me ask you something. you believe the stories of the Bible? I do. I don't think that you, you think somebody just made all this up. No, there was a man named Abraham that was called by God and asked by God to bring his son, his only begotten son, that, that God had promised him up on a mountain and to thrust a knife in his chest. And he was going to do it because he knew that God was real and he knew that God had called him. How dark must have that time been? How did you have children? Because I'm telling you, if you have children, until, until, you, until something's going on with your child that shakes you up, and wait, you don't even realize how much you love them. I'm just telling you that right now. I'm not trying to get all weird on you, but you don't even realize how much you love them. You realize how, how Abraham must have felt? But yet God showed up. Oh, hallelujah. God showed up in the darkest of times. Amen. And God showed up for you and I. I'm closing with these two concepts. He's also Jehovah Rapha. He's the God that heals you. Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals you. In the book of Exodus chapter 15, verses 23 through 26, 
after this illustration, God gives us an illustration. The children of Israel are left, have left Egypt. <coughs> Y'all bear with me. I'm almost done. I promise you. The children of Israel have left Egypt. You know what that means for the Christian? It means you've been saved out of the world. Amen. The children of Israel have been saved out of the world and now they're on their journey. It means you. You live in life now. Amen. The first water in the hole they come to to drink water, guess what happened? The water was bitter. Bitter water. They were mad, aggravated. I'm on this journey. What are you talking about? I got saved. I gave my heart to the Lord. And now I'm walking this journey of life. And all of a sudden I'm thirsty and I got to give me some water. And this water's bitter. God said, throw some wood up in that water. Yes. And he made the water sweet. <laughs> And he went on to tell him that if you will submit to me and you will do, you will follow according to my word, then I will not put upon you the diseases that will be upon the world or, or upon Egypt. For I am the God that healeth you. I am Jehovah Rapha. What I wanted to tell you this morning is this. Is that since you tried to live for the Lord or times that you've been living for the Lord and you've been on your journey or you've tried to be on your journey, whatever your journey looks like. You believe God's real. You've given your heart to Him. Sometimes you come across a pool of bitter water. But I'm here to tell you, God wants to make your water sweet. He put that wood in there. He put cross. He put the cross in human history. To, to give you a sacrifice. To give you a, a Savior. So you can have access to grace. That could strengthen you. And encourage you. The last thing is, is the, is the last point number four was confession. That was all about the name. There was several names that we discussed, but the last point was confession. Because listen, when it all goes down, at some point in time, every knee's going to bow, every tongue's going to confess. Yvette, could you come up and, and, and maybe just start strumming on your guitar? Because I want to give people an opportunity for prayer this morning. And if you got to go, that's fine. We're not going to be like the old school church to make you feel like you got to stay in the seat. If you got to get up and go, that's fine. But, it, but you know what? If you can stay, we're going to stay here. And we're going to give people the opportunity to be prayed for. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord because that's just what church folk do. Amen. Unless you got to take some medicine and go somewhere. Confession. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. I've told y'all this before. I probably shouldn't write on the board because it's so pretty and clean. I didn't write on it. But this word in the Greek, I've said this so many times, y'all probably tired of hearing it. It's a compound word made up of these two words. Hama. We say, we, we've said homo for so long, but it's really pronounced hama. Like homogenized. Hama lagia. Same word. It means to say the same thing. Confession of the mouth. To say the same thing what? Say the same thing as God. Yeah. To bow the knee and to say the same thing as God. What did God say? He humbled himself. He humbled himself and he became a man. So they could be a servant to the Father. So they could serve you and I. So they could die on the cross. And that if you would humble yourself the way that he humbled himself, that God would lift you up. He'd raise you up. He'd give you dignity. He'd give you honor. He'd put in your heart some happiness. He'd turn your bitter water sweet. Is it always going to be a perfect preacher? No, of course it's not always going to be perfect. We live on a fallen earth around a bunch of people that are full of sin. And we ourselves still full of a lot of it. We need help from God. But I promise you, he can make your bitter water sweet. Listen, as Yvette plays this song, whatever she plays and sings, I just want you to know the altars are open. I'd like to pray with you if you need prayer, if you're going through anything.